All right. So uh, my name is Pratik, and uh, I run supportb.com. Uh, Avinash is also around here if you wanna check out what we do. And uh, before this, I used to run a service called Musibu, which I still sort of run, and a couple of other things like uh, Hacker Street. I kind of host it. And so anyway, today we'll talk about Backbone JS, and uh, I think. Oh really? Wow. So today I will talk about Backbone JS. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, also, uh, so I think the talk is not exactly about backbone JS, but it's about actually, you know, kind of learning to love JavaScript. And so most of us look at JavaScript as this language which we just sort of pick up on the way, you know. How many of you guys are familiar with Douglas Crockford, the good parts, right? So if you attend his talks, that's what he says, right? We, we just pick up JavaScript and we never really learn it. So it's about actually learning to see like that you can build like really cool applications in JavaScript. You can structure your code and you can give it as much love as you give, you know, Python or Ruby or PHP. So, so let's get started. And I mean, typically, most people just like love jQuery and stick with jQuery, right? And I, I also really love jQuery. And I've, I've done a prototype app before, prototype JS. And so coming from that background, I really love jQuery. But still, I think jQuery is like good for simple stuff. You know, you want to animate something, you want to change a little DOM or something like that. But if you want to build a full page app, right? You know, it's not really that great. So it's good for a simple website, but if you want to build a single page application, it's not so great. And what do I mean by a single page web app? Just to be on the same page. Um, you know, something like Gmail or the mobile me or the new Twitter. If you've seen the new Twitter web interface, that's, that's a single page app, right? There's no page refreshes and, uh, uh, you know, it behaves almost like a desktop app. So, so that's what we are talking about here. And, uh, so Jeremy is the guy who uh, created Backbone. And so as he says, unless you're a really fastidious coder, some sort of library to help structure large-scale JavaScript applications is important. It's far too easy to degenerate into nested piles of jQuery callbacks, all tied to the concrete DOM. And so I think this is the biggest problem if you're using jQuery to build uh, big applications. You'll be writing so much event, you know, so many callbacks, so many events, and uh, you know, they'll all be tied to your DOM. If you change a class name, it'll all just sort of break down. And uh, so that's where I think something like Backbone comes in. There are a lot of other alternatives like Sprout Core, which there's a talk on, but I'll not really be comparing any of this. We'll just dive into Backbone and we'll keep it short so you can ask questions. So, so just a few properties of complex web, uh, you know, single page apps, which makes it necessary that we have a framework, right? One is uh, all of the logic, client logic is typically on the client side. So how many of you guys have used, you know, you've all used Gmail and like, Pivotal Tracker, they have almost all of their, uh, you know, a big chunk of their logic on the client side. And then, you know, they just keep it in sync with the server. And so they have all of their logic in JavaScript. Uh, they have they have a lot of updates to the UI when the data changes. So, you know, every time a new mail comes in, the listings change, the counters are changing. Uh, if a new reply comes in, it says you have a new reply. So the whole bunch of stuff is happening on the screen at any time. And... Uh, and typically, the templating is happening on the client side. So if you've done a little bit of Ajax, I mean, how many of you have done it in Rails, for instance, Ruby on Rails, right? Or So what you do is you make a call, and you know you send pre-rendered HTML back, and you just insert it in the right dev, and it just gets rendered there. Typically, in a uh, single page app, you don't do that. You send the data back, and then you do templating on the client side. So there was a talk in the morning on uh, Mustache. So something like that. You keep your templating here, because it just keeps it all clean. And uh, yeah, less data on the wire, exactly. Uh, and so to not go crazy building it, because it's pretty easy to go crazy building it, uh, you need like an MVC-like pattern to keep the code clean. You need a templating language like Haml or ERB or Mustache or Handlebars to render view elements. Uh, you need a really good way to manage events and callbacks. And you want to preserve the back button because. Uh, you know, the expectation is set. People want to, people don't care whether it's a single page app or not. You know, you sh if they press back, it should go back to the previous state. And that's a big deal. And you need easy testing. I mean, I'm assuming everybody here test drives their code, right? <laughs> it's 2011. Test drive your code. So, so fortunately, there's help. There's Backbone JS. Uh, it's just 4KB packed in GZIP. The only dependency is underscore JS. Uh, how many of you have played with underscore in the past? Okay. So it gives you all these, you know, maps, select, all these typical functional programming sort of things. And 
it makes it really easy. So it's like the, the missing link in JavaScript. And uh, you need jQuery or Zepto to do Ajax or to do DOM manipulation. And so, so this is one great thing about Backbone, that it's giving you all this stuff uh, to structure your code. But you can still use jQuery to do your DOM manipulation. You can use all of your familiar jQuery plugins for rendering or for doing table sorting. So you don't have to, versus if you go to Sprout Core where you have to use everything that's provided by the framework. So you can just use Backbone to structure your code and then you can just stay in your familiar territory of jQuery or you know uh, Zepto or whatever. And uh, that's a very good, very well annotated source code. And that tool is also written by this guy. Uh, so it's very easy to, it's just 700 lines of code, 700, 750 lines of code. So you can pretty much go through the entire source code and there's no magic happening there. Uh, so what does it give us? It gives us MVC, which is uh, model views and collections. It's not model views and controllers, it's model views and collections. So we'll look at, uh, we'll just go through a little bit of code to build something like this. So this is something like Gmail's, uh, in our case this is like ticket listing. So you know, you have a, so the, so this is, this is like on a whole a ticket listing uh, element, right? And then it has individual ticket rows or emails, I mean, if you prefer that. So basically what we'll be building is like rendering, using Java, uh, using Backbone building something which renders this. And then when you, can, when you click on it, it opens up a particular email. So we'll see how to do this using Backbone. If you were to do this using jQuery, I don't know, I can't even remember how to do this using jQuery. It's so complicated. So anyway, leave that. Uh, so you can build models. Model data is represented as model. So if you have an email, uh, the email object as such, which has that you know subject and the content, that's a model. So data is represented as models. Uh, models can be you can create models, validate them, destroy them, and persist them on the server. So you know you can fetch a model, you can make some changes to it, and then when you save it, it makes a call to the server and saves it back. So it it, it maps really well to uh, you know your server's RESTful paradigm. And uh, and the great thing about models is that if you change an attribute, let's say if you change a subject, so you can bind to a change event, and then in the right place in the UI, you can say, oh, every time this model subject changes, change the subject here. Uh, so so this way you don't have to uh, manually keep track of things. You just keep binding to events. So you so there are a lot of events, and for every attribute there's an event. Model as a whole, there's a change event. So there are a lot of events that Backbone gives you that you can bind to. And that's the right way of doing things in Backbone. So this is how you make, uh, so I'm assuming everybody's like familiar with this namespacing in JavaScript, right? I mean, are you, is everybody from, so you just don't make like global logic, you make like, so as we support the namespace dot model dot ticket summary. So you extend from a Backbone model and you can do your init code here and uh, that's pretty much it. So every time you get a JSON object back, Backbone will take that and you know all the attributes it will or all the fields it will take and create attributes automatically. So all of that work is done for you. You don't have to worry about all that. So so this is like the ticket summary model which will be used to render that uh, row. And and then we have collections. So collections are basically a collection of models. So you have one model and then you have n models. So you, so you have a ticket summary model and then you can have a ticket summary collection which has a lot of models. And um, so collections again have their own events. So every time you add a model to a collection, it has an add event. Every time you remove it, you have a remove event. So let's say, you know, a ticket is deleted. So you can bind to the remove event and take it out of your uh, DOM. So, you know, the recurring theme in Backbone is like to use events for everything, to not like store, you know, pointers to rows or pointers to the views, but to use events and like keep things that way. Because the great thing about that is you don't have to worry about who else is using that event. So, you know, three or four views could be getting updated based on the change to a particular attribute, but you don't have to worry about it. You just write self-contained code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, so actually you will see in the future basically what happens is, uh, I mean, so we will just wait, we will come to it. It is not as simple as that, but we will come back to it. So, so if collections, collection of models triggers events. And so what you can do is you can, uh, how many of you, you are familiar with the RESTful paradigm, right, where you have like slash tickets and then you have slash tickets slash ID. So you can give your um, collection a URL saying slash tickets and it fetches a bunch of tickets 
and then it understands that this is a collection of these models, so it will initialize individual models for you. At the same time, it will keep calling those add callbacks, so you can do something about it. So you can fetch uh, from a collection, and then when you're saving, if let's say an individual model back, it will derive its own URL from the collection. So it knows collection is slash tickets, so my ID must be slash ticket slash ID. So it all maps really cleanly with, you know, restful uh, sort of URL structure. And uh, really well, I'll show that actually. So, and one other thing is that you can define a comparator in, uh, in your collection. So what happens, every time you add a new model, it will invoke that comparator and insert it in the right order. So you can be sure that your mo if, you, if you worry about the order of models, you can be sure that it stays in that particular order. So they have this one neat thing. And so this is how collections look like. This is uh, a ticket list collection. It's a collection of the model that we just defined, ticket summary model. This is the URL it should fetch from. So this is a name ticket. This can be used for passing, like if you send your JSON with a top level namespace thing, you know, you can decide if you want. So you can use something like this for that. And again, this has an initialize. And uh, so you can do some stuff here you want to do. So you can, um, I don't know, what you may want to do here. Yeah, so no, uh, I'll show that actually. So let's come back, let's come to the views. So, so unlike, like, let's say if you're familiar, uh, you know, if you're comfortable with Rails or, uh, you know, Python or, typically the views there are very dumb things which just pretty much like render stuff. In here actually views are more like controllers. Views are the ones responsible for initializing things and hooking them up to each other. So views are actually like pretty intelligent in backbone. So they are more like Rails controllers. And they are responsible for instantiating collections, binding events, doing the fetches, as you asked, all of that stuff. So if you see this view is pretty complicated, right? right? So what you do is you initialize the view. Now see, what we wanted to do a listing, which is like a typical UL LI thing, right? You have a topic. So you can just say this. This ticket list view, the entire view, is a UL. So it will initialize it with a div, uh, sorry, with a tag UL. So you say it's a UL, um, and then here you initialize a collection. So you say, okay, this dot ticket list is this collection. Now, uh, by knowledge, uh, if you were in this talk, the first talk of objects, this basically makes sure every time add on or add on this one, the list is already bound to this object here. So this is an underscore thing. You don't have to, don't worry too much about it. The interesting thing is here now you can say that on the ticket list add even bind add on and on a refresh even bind add on. So what when you fetch from the server a collection of tickets, the refresh event is going to be called, which will basically uh, which will call add one on each. And when you see add one, what it does is it passes in that particular model and instantiates another view. So those will be the actual rows. So this is the big view. Uh, this is the one which contains all of these and then each of them will be individually initialized over here. So every time this is done and it will initialize the view, take this and append to the DOM. And now the interesting thing over here is if you see we are not worrying about the actual class name or the actual ID of the um, thing. So we have, when you do a dollar this dot el, we have already, the selector is already spoke to this ul tag. So everything is happening inside that UL now. So you don't have to worry about where it is placed in the page, what is its ID, it doesn't really matter anymore. So this way you can just worry about the particular component you are working on and you don't have to worry about the page as a whole. So right away all your worries like drop by like a factor of 10 or something. So you initialize a ticket summary view, pass it a model and then once you are done with that you basically start appending it. And as we'll see in this one, so so ticket summary, I think that snippet is not here. So this will have a top level, oh, actually it's in the end. So this will be the LIs. So this will be the each individual LIs which will be created and appended to the UL. And so again the same kind of thing what you do over here is, uh, uh, actually, so one thing that you can do in use is you can pass it events. So you can say on click, do this. And again as you see, you're not particularly, you're not really thinking in terms of the DOM a lot, you're just saying, this view as a whole has this link event and one click event open ticket. And on open ticket what we do is we change the href, you know, we change the location and that should somehow get handled. 
So you are just worrying about like little pieces of functionality. You are never worrying about the app as a whole or the page as a whole. You are decoupling from the DOM. You are decoupling from the DOM and, it, and even when you are like Conventionally, when uh, you know you would like render uh, UL and then you would run a for loop and enter LI, you are not doing that anymore. So the benefit of that is, let's say now you have a new ticket, you add it to the collection, immediately the add will be fired, which will fire the add one, which will insert it into the DOM. So like, you know, it just stays like really clean. Can you take it later? Yeah, yeah, okay. You just finish this flow. It was very hard for it to stay in your head for too long. So one thing which we are doing over here is that in the render here, we are actually calling a template and we are passing it the model. So this is the client side templating that I was talking about. So if you see, in any of this, there is no HTML really, right? And you should not have that because your HTML can change, but this structure as such is going to stay the same. So for that, you use client side. Uh, yeah. So this is defined in handlebars. So we use a templating language called handlebars, which is a it's a super set of mustache. So this is your template. So, so here is here because the code went out of sync a bit. It should have been any different. So what you can do here, it's like a very logical system. You can't really do much logic. You can't run loops here. You can't. Like you can do simple if else. So this is like an if else. If it's hundred, then bold it. If it's not hundred, then don't bold the subject. This is a helper. So you can define and uh, you can define some helpers. You can say from the requester object extract a name or email. So if you want to do anything complicated, you define helpers. But overall, your uh, template stays very, very simple. So what a ticket summary view would do is it would just pass it a right object, a ticket object with a top level element ticket, and it will render this. This thing will come back and be rendered as a ticket row. Yeah, it's your just personal preference. I mean, um, so this has. Uh, you know, you can go one level up in the namespace in JSON, and so you can do a bunch of fancy things with uh, handlebars. So it just makes it a lot easier. And uh, so yeah, this is the URL thing which you know we were talking about. Uh, so collections have a URL. The models derive the URL from the collection, or you can define individually if you want. And they map really well. So create maps to post slash color, read, get, update, export, delete, is delete. So it maps like really well with the restful thing, and uh, and finally, uh, Backbone gives you some. Um, uh, they you have to write a logic for that, so you have to write some custom logic for that. And uh, so actually, I can kind of tell in this. So finally, you have the router. I mean, it, this is the one which makes sure that you are responding to particular URL. So like in the ticket summary we saw, when we click, it just changes the URL, but then what happens? So the router is one which makes that magic happen. So when the URLs change, this is the one which catches the URL and calls the right uh, you know, functionality. So, so they are used for setting up routes. The great thing is you can add routes during runtime. So you know, as, and this, so you may not immediately see the benefit of that, but it's like really useful if you have, uh, I don't know if you start building a real app. And <laughs> so you can add routes during runtime. And uh, so this is how it looks like. Um, so these are not HTML5 routes, but you can opt in if you want. So what this means is, right when my app is served, if it's like, let's say the app is app.com, right? Our app.com, when there's nothing after that, match the dashboard route, let's say. So the app you are, will match this route. The dashboard route, in our case, what it would do is, it would create that ticket list view, that big listing, a new instance of that. And it will actually append it. So this is where you append it to a particular place in the DOM. Until now, you don't actually care about where it's, it, it's not even in the page actually as such. So this is where you append it to the uh, uh, DOM and show it. And when you match ID, uh, you know, something like this, or dash ID, then you match the open ticket route and hide that is automatically call that uh, I'll just show that actually. So, so you're getting right. So this is where the sort of magic happens. So, so that's why it's very easy to support. Uh, you know, people can copy a URL and send, and it's not dependent on the state at all because the right URL will be matched. And then you can say this is the default URL, so match this one or whatever. You know. So, so it's very easy to prefer, preserve back button and also like have people be able to copy and recreate the state of the app. Uh, in a new browser. 
and yeah so that is the entry point yes so yeah so what you do is you basically uh, you just say you know uh, you initialize that and then you say you start the history and this is this is where you can opt into push state but you'll have to change the urls to slash but if push state is not supported backbone will change them back to hash or if so people what specify that is that they say slash or hash or nothing no so if you want html it should be slash actually they want to use the hash things, but back will change it if it's not supported. Why not just ask us uh, without, uh, without a slash and just back will take that? Yeah, that's true too. I don't know. <laughs> and one thing is back is itself like a moving tile, so they do keep changing stuff. So you know, for all that it may change. And uh, so you basically to run your app, you initialize a new router. Sorry, yeah. Question. And what if I happen to so if you said that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to. Uh, it's not so much true for the hash URLs because the hash URLs are ultimately loading the same page. But if it's a slash URL, yeah, your server should understand that. You have to configure your server like that. Yep. So it needs uh, server side support. And uh, so we initialize a router instance since that is the default one. It matches the dashboard route, which. Uh, creates a new instance of ticket list view, which creates a ticket list collection and f fetches it. The fetch calls refresh. The refresh is already bound. Uh, so the refresh handler renders ticket summary for each of the tickets fetched and starts appending them to the DOM. So basically, this is the uh, process. Now, once it is rendered, each, each of these ticket summary, as we saw, at an on-click handler. So you click on it. It changes the URL to hash ticket ID, which matches the second route that we have defined, which is responsible for instantiating an individual ticket uh, view. We did not see the code for that, but you can write the code for that, and you know. So, so basically, the paradigm is you initialize your app, match the default route or something, and then after that, at least that's the way I do it. You know, I just keep changing URLs and keep matching those URLs to some handlers. So. Other than, you, get, you can always like on click just change the page, but that way you'll not get the benefits of the back button or browser history or anything. So you should avoid that. And but HTML, if you yeah, opt into HTML5, then it can be slash too. No, this was, I did that, I mean, uh, but you can define slash actually. No, but uh, no, no. HTML5 it won't reload. It's a push state, so it won't. It will just. So that's like if you have seen that GitHub's uh, brow, uh, code browser, right? It's actually the URL is seen, but the page doesn't reload. So you can go and check it out. So when you click browse your repository is there, the URLs will keep changing, but the page won't be reloading. So. So one thing is that uh, so far we have like looked at models as things which are uh, bound, which have something on the server. So if you have a ticket model, you'll have a ticket API. But backbone models are not just for API, uh, you know, for API back models. So what, like in our um, application, what we have done is, I can. Maybe. So so this is something like how, how our app looks like, right? And so what we've done is actually even these things are rendered using code. So you can define a JSON which says give me a my ticket screen which renders these screens and renders these buttons. So in a way there, that's also data. That's some data, right? But there is no corresponding API in the back end. But you can, the great thing that happens is what you can do is you can use your views and you can use a collection and say, oh, every time a new screen is added, insert a element over here and find these events. So this is where that you know dynamic routing comes helps. So you can say, okay, this is the URL for this. So you should use this code organization even for other things in your application, not just for things that you're fetching from the server. So let's see, what do some uh, things uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. How how will that change uh, so the way we have done it is um um I can actually 
let's see if the code is here yeah so if you can see what we do is we basically as i said everything in r is triggered by a uh, rouse so what we just do is we change the url to slash search slash query okay. and then we handle this out in the open search listing okay. and so that's how you can handle pagination so you can say slash search colon query and page colon page and you open the same search listing but in the handle you pass up page parameter and so when you are making the api call you pass that page there so so as i said we just handle everything using urls actually yeah, but uh, how will the collection change there no so you the collection what you will define a new you will instantiate a new screen a new view and then you will replace your current view with that view what we do is we keep a stack of views so when you press the back button the older one is just like popped out and uh, made the current one so yeah so these are some of the patterns that you can use so what we have is uh, we have something called uh, up current view so so what so what we do is we don't actually manipulate the dom directly we just say okay the current view set this particular view as a current view so then that takes it and sets it as a current view and when it's and for all the older views it will hide and also for something like you are not a current view so then you can either recycle them and remove them from your dom or you can reduce the polling frequency or do whatever you want so you know we have to sort of develop this framework for ourselves so ultimately you will have to do something like this if you are writing a very complicated app and uh, so um backbone has a module called backbone sync you can override it to uh, so people have written local uh, you know history thing adapters and so you can do all of that so just wanted to test uh, touch upon testing so we we at least like so this is like really 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 complicated code so you know there are refreshes happening there like whole if you are writing it without test cases you are just insane right i mean you are really insane because you can never iterate on it ever because whether it's polling every 5 second or not or whether it's removing or not you will just go crazy manually testing it. so you should write test driven code so we use jasmine for it which is a very popular choice right now and uh, so we can write something like this so so we can say okay create a new ticket summary now expect the top level element to have a ticket have a name requester or if you click it so you know this will you have yellow click and it should expect the windows location to change so you can write you know your jasmine code like this and it makes it a lot more manageable and you don't want to make network calls so you can use synon there's something called synon js for mocking and stubbing so you can do something like this you can say okay create give me a fake server at this one it should give me this batch so every time i create a new listing and i do fetch it will actually give me this thing back so you don't really talk to your back end and so it keeps the test very fast and uh, very manageable and uh, you can use test unit or whatever but i mean if you're familiar with r spec jasmine has a very behavior driven development uh, sort of flavor to it so you know expectations and uh, you know nice error messages and all of that stuff and um, yep so this is what we do and if you find all this exciting you should come and work for us <laughs> so we work on cutting edge stuff like we said we give you a macbook pro we have xboxes you will be programmer number 3 so avinash is number 2 i am number 1 we number 3 we are already sort of public beta another thing is we have a company you should definitely check us out for your customer support uh, we have a couple of customers including some really big ones which unfortunately we cannot disclose until we have officially signed them up and uh, yep so so much for that and yep questions i think we something yep okay uh, right uh, so how do you automate this what is the reporting of it just no so it jasmine gives you a command line um, rake task which you can put as a part of your continuous integration build or something okay. so and that's what it is normally uh i also i've just run firefox uh, in the virtual frame buffer phantom yeah yeah we want to but yeah so that's the thing right you know when you are two people you can only do so much So, <laughs> but yeah, Phantom is, I think, a definitely an emerging choice for a lot of people. It's a headless browser, so.
Oh, really? Something very similar. Oh. But anyway, we run our cucumber specs, and so we, in our continuous integration, we run our spec uh, cucumber, which which needs a Firefox thing. You can probably do Phantom, but it is proven to work on Firefox, so we just and then we do uh, Jasmine. So we have just uh, so we just uh, in the f your virtual frame buffer, you can run our Firefox, so it will invoke it in memory, and it will just keep. You can connect to it using VNC if you want and debug and. Yeah, the, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So, do you maintain a copy of your model on the server directly on the client? So, yeah, that's actually a pretty cool question to ask. So, what we have done is we have written a pretty fancy thing on top of it. So, what we have done is we have. Uh, so, where is it? Okay. So actually, uh, so we have written a, a little wrapper. So what you can say is you can say something like keep in sync true. So what it does is, like every time now you initialize a model, uh, it will actually, it, it's like an identity map thing. So you know, it will actually take, if already a model exists with that ID, it will take that object, but it will sort of reinitialize it with new attributes that you pass, or if you do a fetch, it will fetch. So what happens is, even if you have, so like there is a ticket summary with a ticket with for a particular ticket. Then there's a full ticket view. And as I said, we keep the views so that you know when you do back and forth, it's really fast. But if you initialize different mod, which is the backbone's default behavior, then if you change something here, it won't be reflected there unless you do the next refresh. But if you do something like that, it's basically all bound to the same object. And so you change one attribute here, and if you're bound to the call, everything changes uh, for uh, all, everything bound to that object. So, so the no, so when you do save, it will be uh, preserved there. Any? Yeah, yeah, you have to do explicit save. Yeah. And your server is designated crud app. Yeah, it's a crud app. So, our, yeah. so one big benefit of doing something like back one or single page app is that you have a fully functioning API uh, right when you you know you have a version one of the product. So everything that yeah, in our case, the admin side of things we still do using Rail, Rails views, but everything else is just yeah, it's a JSON API. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Though we recommend using Postgres. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what? So what we have done is we have done. Uh, um, yeah. So this is the thing which we have written. So it, it's like a little cache store which uh, keeps a copy of initialized reference to initialized models, and then when you are creating a new model, it basically checks if it one already exists and all that. So it works pretty well. Yep. No, not yet, not yet. I mean, we can do all of that. It's already pretty snappy, actually. Unfortunately, there's no internet, so it's not fetching the right font. But if you if if, if you see the URLs change and the back button is like pretty snappy, uh, you know, you can go to a new listing, and this is coming locally, so it's kind of slow. Uh, um, that's a good question. I don't know. I personally don't really care that much about it because uh, the exp I mean it's like if you're using Gmail, people are already used to downloading a big file. So, so as of now, I don't really care about it. Maybe when we go like really mainstream and you know we have to optimize. So, first time down, down. yeah, first time down because everything gets come even your handlebars, everything gets compiled into one big ass file and it gets downloaded. After that, it's only JSON transferred. So after that, every time you do. Uh, uh, Oh really? Okay, I don't know. So here, anyway, it's a development, so everything is not concatenated, but you can concatenate and send. And then after that, it's just uh, you know XHR requests. Yeah. Right now, it's all server. But as I said, you can override that backbone sync module, and so every time you do save, you can save a local copy and then save. So it's pretty easy to override all of that stuff. Hey, just outside this, just a different question. Have you thought about uh, how to protect your code? Uh, no, actually, we want to open source this app. Because if you think about it, it's like the de facto reference for our own API. So, I mean, I actually wrote a blog post about it. So my philosophy is that the 
core of your uh, product is actually the API and you know all the user experience. And if you want people to adopt your API and if you put this code out, it's actually like a very good rep because it always stays in sync. So people can just look at it and see how the API functions. So there's actually no reason to try to protect it, really. Um, the underscore comes with the templating language. Uh, uh, no, no, no. That, that's what I said. So you can use your uh, regular jQuery plugins for all of that. There is no. So this dollar is a jQuery dollar. So you can do whatever you want. So when you say dollar of certain element, it gives you a jQuery uh, whatever the DOM object or something back, and you can do whatever you want with it. So you can use any plugin. Can I use jQuery data templates with this? Because the way I see it is these guys don't come up with, uh, they don't have any, so if I want to view a data, I want to data get more. I don't write a template for it. Uh, yeah, you can use, you can, uh, handlebars is just our choice. I mean, you can use whichever templating language you want. And two, one thing which we use is we use something called Jamit. At least for Ruby projects, it's like really. So that will compile your templates and make it available in a global namespace. And so it makes it very easy to use. But yeah, you are free to use uh, any templating language you want. Uh, you, uh, spine with, uh, yeah, so Spine came out after Backbone. So some of the things which were missing in, uh, which Spine did better than Backbone were like this identity map, but we had already written our own. So, so what would you recommend? I, mean, I think give both a, uh, you know, uh, good shot and, and see which one works for you. No, we have a poll right now. We want to, I mean, if you were in the last talk, I don't know if we, so we want to do more like a push assisted polling thing, which is like, because polling, uh, so push works really well when everybody's tied to one channel. So if you are on a ticket and you want to update the replies, it works well. But if it's, here there are a lot of combinations depending on who's logged in, which company, which view they are on. So what we want to do is we want to just, uh, broadcast an event saying, okay, in your company tickets have been updated. So then you can initiate a poll. So maybe we'll do that later. You can use it if you want. I mean, I think you'll just have to make sure that the dollar. Um, but uh, why should, why would you want to use prototype? <laughs> uh, so, sorry, you can use it if you want. Yeah. So you said that you already have a Google specs on your face cover, right? Yeah. We use uh, Capybara. Yep. Capybara, so you can integrate Serenium with this Capybara, then you can actually, you, you, because you are basically running in web app, so you need Serenium testing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We so need browser. Right, if you are actually, if you are having a CA server on server, right, you cannot run that, like. No, you can, that's what I was saying. So you can, there's something called XVFB, X Virtual Frame Buffer, which is like having a display but in memory. Oh. So your browser will launch in memory, and if you want, you can even connect to it using VNC. So, um, so, I mean, it's like having a real browser. So you don't have to do any changes. Now there are some gems. If you use awesome Ruby, then you have gems for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 it does. You can opt into HTML5 push state. No, older browsers, it will fall back to the hash thing. Yeah. Yep. Older browsers, you'll fall back to the hash. Thing. And uh, yep. Thanks. Any other question? I'm anyway hanging out here. So if you guys want to ch chat. Okay. Thank you.